So, where to begin? Vinny Perth there talking about what comes next. He's right. If, if Manchester United don't actually have a plan for this contingency, then that does not speak very well about uh, the club. But I suppose we wouldn't be terribly surprised to find that. What do you think is the right thing to do? Is, it, is an interim manager the right thing to do? Or should you just go balls out and try and get somebody right now? They should definitely be trying to get somebody right now, but ultimately it depends if the right person is available. Now, I don't have any confidence whatsoever in United to pick the right person because ultimately, who is it who's going to make the decision? Um, I mean, Joel Glazer is the person who makes all the ultimate decisions and I believe that there were others at the club who would have fired Ole more, much sooner than yesterday, but he chose not to. And so ultimately, it will be him that makes the decision regarding the new manager. And what does Joel Glazer know about football? Not very much. He's not a football person. I mean, I'm sure he'll take advice from Darren Fletcher and John Murta, but those two don't have loads of experience of doing this either. And I think I was, in most, there are very few managers that are absolute bankers who succeed in every job. Most managers don't. So there's no one who anyone could say, well, if we give it him, he'll definitely succeed. And I'm, I mean, I heard the uh, the tape just before about Zidane, who has obviously succeeded brilliantly in most some aspects of Real Madrid. Um, doesn't look like Zidane wants to come to United. I don't suppose he, he wouldn't be my choice anyway. I mean, but as I said, you never know. Like Zidane maybe could turn up and be brilliant. But managing this version of Manchester United is not the same as managing a team where you've got prime Marcelo, Varane, Ramos, Casemiro, Modric, Kroos, one of the greatest midfielders in the history of football, prime Ronaldo, Bale, Benzema. But he's not going to have that. And that kind of team, I mean, I'm not saying that Zidane didn't do anything with regard to coaching or tactics, but he turned up and there weren't a lot of players that weren't already close to their maximum level who needed improving. And... When you have a midfield like that, you're going to control most games. When you've got Ronaldo at his peak, he's going to score in most games, and that's quite a decent starting point, whereas United's slightly different. They just lost 4-1 to Watford. They lost 4-2 to Leicester a few weeks ago, and in, in between times, they've been battered by City and Liverpool. That's not what Zidane walked into. And, I mean, I, I think that when I look at the players, the one who seems the best fit is probably Pochettino. I think Pochettino would probably do a good job with these, but he's busy making a mess in Paris, so who knows? <laughs> you, you touched an interesting point there, Daniel. How appealing is this job with the squad that you will inherit um, and the problems they're in? Uh, I, think, I think it's extremely appealing. Not necessarily appealing to everyone. I'm not sure that it's Manchester United that doesn't appeal to Sudan as much as doesn't want to manage in England, doesn't want to live in England. Um, his wife doesn't want to live in England. So I think that the job it would be extremely appealing. I mean, I, I, I don't have an inside track on this, but people that say they do are saying that Pochettino wants the job and would take it now. If that's the case, then they should be doing everything possible to get Pochettino out of Paris because he's someone that even if you preferred Eric Ten Hag, I don't believe that anyone could be so sure that Eric Ten Hag would succeed that they think that he would be worth writing off this season for to get in the summer. Let's say you couldn't get Ten Hag now. Let's say you could only get Ten Hag in the summer. I definitely wouldn't be so convinced of Ten Hag succeeding that I'd say no to Pochettino now to get Ten Hag in the summer. There are probably managers that I would say no to right now in order to wait to the summer if it meant that I had to wait for Pochettino or Ten Hag until then I wouldn't go and get Brendan Rodgers now if I could and maybe I couldn't I don't know but I wouldn't get Brendan Rodgers now I'd wait for the summer to get those two because I think those two would be better appointments than Brendan Rodgers but we don't know who's available and but as I said reports are saying that Pochettino would take it if that's true I would be making sure that I got Pochettino now because I think the kind of football that Pochettino wants to play is the kind of football that he could play with this squad I think he has a personality that means that you can take over a club. And if you look at the people that have succeeded at United post-war, um, Alex Ferguson and Matt Busby, but also not just them, the people that have had any success, really. Van Gaal won a trophy, Mourinho won a couple of the trophies, Tommy Doherty. Big Ron. What they've, what, pardon me? Big Ron. Yeah, Big Ron. What they've all had is they've had a personality that enables them to handle the pressure of managing a club as big as United and to not consume the club with their personality, but to dominate it with their personality, to inspire the players. And those are the guys that have succeeded, in even to some small degree. And it doesn't mean that anyone will succeed, but the guys that didn't win anything, um, I would, uh, Dave Sexton, quiet man, Ole, a nice guy whose personality went some way, but in the end, um, aside from the coaching stuff, which I guess we'll come to, he probably wasn't ruthless enough or imaginative enough either. 
the, the last time you were on, you 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 completely did. The last time I was on, Channel, you completely defended Ronaldo in terms of his form since he came in. But like the, for me, the basic point remains here: if a new manager comes in, what does he do with Ronaldo? Does he play him all the time? What's his influence in the dressing room? Um, and how does he play offensive players around Ronaldo who are actually realizing their potential when clearly they're not at the moment? Um, I didn't I didn't completely defend Ronaldo. What I said was this is not Ronaldo's fault. Yeah, it's, sorry. Um, I, 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 I can see that the problem. I, I wrote it when United when United signed him that can they press from the front with Ronaldo? Would all they have the nat? Would all they have the knackers to tell him that he wasn't playing today? And those those were problems that we could all foresee. Mm. What I'm saying is that if you took Ronaldo out of what we've seen so far this season, United would already be out of the Champions League, and that 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 would not be a good thing. So it's not it's not that. It's that I also think that someone like Pochettino might be able to get a system whereby you can cover for the fact that Ronaldo doesn't press. One of the best teams, maybe the best team we've ever seen in the Premier League, United, 07, United from 07 to 09, they won three straight leagues and they won the Champions League and they got to the Champions League final. They won with Ronaldo and the team not doing a whole lot of pressing. I'm not, I, I'm not having that there isn't a way of making that happen if you get the rest of the team around him right. That doesn't mean that I think Ronaldo is the future of United. I don't. And I think like a lot of United supporters, when I think about it as a supporter, I'm extremely interested to see how a forward line of Sancho, Greenwood and, Ren and, um, and Rashford works. Mm. But that doesn't mean that I would toss Ronaldo out necessarily because I think he's still a, he's still a brilliant player. And he's still an option. And that's one of the reasons you need a personality. You need someone who has the who has the political capital to drop Ronaldo if he wants to, to leave Ronaldo out if he doesn't think he's suitable for the game, but also to devise the system. I mean, at Madrid, I think what happened was Marcelo did a lot of Ronaldo's pressing because he was young, he was athletic. Um, I think that United would might, United have Luke Shaw who might be able to do that, but there are also different ways of playing. You don't have to play a particular way. I don't think Chelsea do that much pressing. But they're top of the league because they're top of the league because they've got a manager who's found a system that works with the players. And also, I think what's why why Chelsea top of the league is because there are a lot of good players in the league now and the most solid team at the top of the league. Not, and I think I said this last time, not the team who have the highest top level, which is Manchester City. So I don't think it would be a matter of let's say Pochettino gets the job, of Pochettino coming in and me expecting him to suddenly stop picking Ronaldo and play that front three that I just talked about in every game because. That's not necessarily what you want in every game, particularly against teams that sit back, where it's not so much about pressing as it is about men getting men into the box, using the width of the pitch, putting crosses, cutbacks into the box. And at that point, Ronaldo is an extremely useless weapon to have. So there are different things that work for every game. When when Fergie was manager, and I don't want to hark back necessarily to Fergie, but what and a lot of home games against crap teams, you play 4-4-2 because... He knew, United, he knew United would dominate the ball, so 4-4-2 gave him the opportunity to play, to get full-backs wide, to get wide players wide, and to get two men in the box. And it was really only in the big games, mainly, that he would be playing 4-3-3, he'd be playing four, three, three. because at that point, he did that extra man in midfield. So it's not just about saying, well, a manager coming in, deciding what his first team is, and then picking it in every single game. I do think that the new manager needs to do what what Solskjaer didn't do and have roughly a first team that plays in a system and then you change one or two players maybe from game to game because you need to keep everyone fresh, you need to keep everyone on their toes and sometimes just opposition means that different players are suitable. And I think that Ronaldo can fit in quite well to that but I don't think that he should necessarily be an automatic choice. But as I said last time you asked me about this, if you had a fully functioning team behind him and then Ronaldo, you'd see a much better version of Ronaldo than the one that we've seen so far. And But again, if you look at United and they conceded four goals against Leicester, five goals against Liverpool, two goals that could have been 22 goals against Manchester City, and then four goals against Watford, if you're telling me that the problem is Cristiano Ronaldo with that, I, I can't go along with that because... What? I'm watching defenders regularly turn up giving not what? even five out of ten performances, mm. turning up giving one out of ten performances. Why are they doing that? Why, yeah, that is the question. Yeah. Why, so, are, why is Maguire so bad? Why, why is... When, okay, who's responsible for that? And what's the share in the seesaw of blame from the, the players actually carrying some water for what's happened here and obviously Solskjaer for allowing whatever happened, happen? So, right, well, we can all sit here and we can say like Ole's coaching has proven and his team of coaches has proven not to be good enough over the period. I, 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 don't, I don't think we can dispute that. I, I definitely hoped 
that he would hire some experts like and who, who would make a difference. And I also thought that, as we saw last season, that what he was doing was he was getting good players in the right positions and they were getting them enough of the ball for them to express themselves and that to be enough. Now, the way that it has dropped off this season is extremely alarming and extremely weird, ultimately, because him not being good enough to take United from second to first shouldn't surprise anyone. But the what is the difference between what he was asking them to do this season when they're absolutely dreadful and what he asked them to do last season when they finished second in the league and played some good football? And the difference there has to ultimately be the players. Now, in any job, if you turn up and you deliver your Z game and then try and blame it on your boss, your boss will have some words to say. And I can't blame Ole. I can blame Ole. I can say, well, you shouldn't have signed Harry Maguire. I said at the time that you shouldn't have signed Harry Maguire. And I can blame Ole for signing Harry Maguire because I felt like he signed the player that he hoped Maguire was, that Maguire's PR suggests to us that he is. There wasn't a player that I thought that Maguire was. But if Maguire and Luke Shaw had turned up and delivered even four or five out of ten performances, or they would still have a job. Now, I'm not even saying that's the best thing for Manchester United, but it would be the case. The reason why United keep getting battered is because their defenders keep turning up, in particular the defenders, and delivering one out, two out of ten level performances. And as a, as a, as a professional, as an elite level professional, as a human being, as a worker, you owe your boss, the person that pays your salary, you owe it to yourself, particularly if you do this kind of job, better than that. Now, I don't want to say too much about what's going on with them because you're never sure what's going on in people's lives yeah. and people's personal lives as to why they play like that. Well, it's, just, it's just that it happened to so many of them at the same time. That, that so many of them, it, it's not just, it's so wan Saka, it's Maguire, it's Shaw, it's anybody who's gone in there. Um, okay, so we can look at it like that, or we can say, I, I, I don't have the answers to this because I don't even know if anyone knows the answers to this. I don't know if the answers to this even exist. How many of England's um, England squad are playing well at the moment and started the season well? That's Declan a good point. Rice. I mean, Declan Rice, maybe, but Kai Saka, not Foden, many. Like Foden's been in and out with injuries and they're minding him, but he's, he's playing well. Um, yeah, he, I mean, and and Foden, I mean, ultimately, comparing Foden and Harry Maguire is just ludicrous. No, I mean, but the point is, are they playing well? They're, he is playing well. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's but I, I mean, what I mean is that Phil Foden is going to be maybe the best player in the world, one of the best players of this generation. He's an amazing talent, and so his ability to override the mental drop, and he didn't play in the final. He didn't play in the semi, I don't think he did. So perhaps there's that as well. He didn't play as much in the summer. He, the mental t- mental anguish wasn't as great. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm speculating. Okay. As I said, I don't know if anyone knows the well, answer. Me... But it's not hard. What I'm saying is it's not hard to devise reasons as to why Phil Foden's struggling with something that Harry Maguire isn't struggling with something. I don't want to make excuses for Harry Maguire. Well, let, let's... Because... So what, what's Bruno's excuse? Because his form isn't what it was. I, I guess what I'm saying is it looks like... The, the whole stereotype of he lost the dressing room seems to be true in this instance and in that so many players are playing and it's not just no, the other players. Just, yeah, no, I think, that, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. But what, if, if I look, if you're, if you're saying to me, what is the root of this? Now, if you're, and I'm not just talking about Bruno Fernandes, if you're the midfield and the strikers playing in front of that defence, that is going to be a problem for you because if you watched like, the first half, particularly against Watford, Watford just absolutely swamped United in midfield, and, and, and United couldn't get the ball away. They couldn't find decent passes out of defence. So that is necessarily going to impact the rest of the team. And when you when you have this situation, there's a lot of blame to go around. So it's pointless to say, well, it was this or it was that, when you look at it, and it's like, well, it's, it's all of it. And where the all of it begins, to me, is probably with... I mean, the, man, the manager would always be responsible for it because he picks the team, he signs the players, and he's the guy who's responsible. So you, Ole obviously has has to go. I mean, he had to get fired. I said on here, I would have fired him after Leicester. Well, that was the point for me where you could say, like, it is definitely never going to get good enough. And from here, it's probably only going to get worse. They should have fired him then. They didn't. But anyway. So, but... Bruno, Bruno played badly against Bruno played badly um, against Watford, and he hasn't played well in recent weeks. But he's not delivering the same level of howlers that Maguire and Luke Shaw have delivered. And I don't say this particularly with any, I don't, with any anger at these guys. I, I, as I said, I don't know what's going on, and I can't understand the mental drop of what happens to them in the summer, of the effort they put into the summer, if that's what it is. But there definitely is a point at which. It, the level of performance of Maguire in particular has been 
bizarre in how bad it's been and some of the worst performances I've ever seen in all the time I've been watching football. They're and true, you they're them, true. You can blame the manager for that if you like. And the manager certainly has levels of responsibility that start with him signing Maguire, and then you can add giving him the captaincy if you like. But it still doesn't un- that still doesn't explain why someone as good as Harry Maguire, and I don't think Harry Maguire is the best centre back I've ever seen, but we know that he's a is a decent player. He's a decent player. He's a decent Premier League player. He can go to a tournament and play well. So that level of player should be playing so badly. I don't know what the answer to that is, but I do know that the main answer to that is not are they going to sell shots, it's Harry Maguire. And I don't know what within Harry Maguire is making that happen, but I know that the answer relates to Harry Maguire because when something is that bad, you can't blame someone else for it. You've got to take responsibility yourself, and I'm sure Harry Maguire himself would recognise that in a classically hand, hang-dog interview if we had it. Yeah, OK. Let's talk about potential interim managers at the moment. Are there any names out there that are doing the rounds or that are in the ether that we haven't considered for this job yet. Is Wayne Rooney a potential? I mean, certainly somebody in the Wayne Rooney camp last night was letting it be known on Sky that he would find it very difficult to turn down <laughs> and, and escape from the, the current shit show. Especially that he's in. plus 21 points. It would like. be amazing if you're like, I'm getting out of this and then at the end of the summer I can retire properly and go, okay. Uh, um, I, I mean, I, 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 doubt, I doubt it would be Wayne Rooney as opposed to... Michael Carrick or Darren Fletcher. I I I, I don't. I, I I think I'd be surprised if they went and if they went and did that. I mean, I, I've I've no idea. I mean, you see the names like there's Ralph Rangnick, but he would probably want to be director of football thereafter. They might not want that. Um, that probably is the. He would probably be assuming that they couldn't get Pochettino now, which seems like a, quite a big assumption because if Pochettino gets whacked by Man- by City this week, then and tells Paris that he wants to leave, and Paris know they can get Zidane, then that sort of arrangement seems like one that might work for everybody. Okay, I don't... okay. so that that's probably the most... Zizou's missus doesn't mind living in Paris. No, that's probably the most <laughs> likely. Very... Yeah. Uh, but then maybe they win this game this week, I don't know. So if we just take Pochettino... I mean, the off... thing is, is yeah, what, like, this, this week is just an absolutely monstrous game now for United, mm. because we said all along that this squad is good enough to do something in the Champions League. Like, the league always felt like a bit of a stretch because there's, to, like, City are, be- City are better than them and Chelsea are better than them. Or, and... Liverpool. So to finish, to finish higher than those teams would take something colossal. But this team are good enough to beat any team um, over two legs or in a one-on-one game if things are going well. So they need to make... They need to do something to make because to make sure that they get a point off Villarreal. I mean, ultimately, they they could lose to Villarreal, beat Young Boys, and it'd be enough if Atalanta don't win both games. But the main thing they need to somehow find a way of getting by Villarreal, and that's one of the reasons I was so surprised that they didn't do something with Ole in the international break because mm. it was just so obvious it wasn't going to get better. They had two weeks clear to actually get someone in to do something with the squad, and then what's happened is they're now. Three further points off the top four. I mean, they're not they're not out of reach by any stretch, but then there's three more points that they need to get, having tossed them to Watford, and they've got this colossal game coming up on Tuesday. So, I mean, who knows what Michael Carrick's going to do? I mean, I, I think that it was at the point with Ole, and it's been at that point for a couple few weeks now, where it almost, in fact, it doesn't matter because it is not possible to get less out of the squad. So, whoever they bring in, if they haven't got Neil Warnock, the one thing that you knew was it wouldn't be worse. Maybe okay. it wouldn't be better, maybe it won't be better enough, but it, it was the same with Mourinho, it was the same with Van Gaal, it was the same with Moyes. It gets to a point where it's not possible for them to get any less out of the players that they've got, so anyone you bring in will make it better. You're, you're such, it's such a good point. Why they waited until this... The, uh, why, why they waited for the worst? Because it was so obvious things could not well, get any worse. It's the fallacy of sunk costs that they decided that they were going to back Solskjaer for the next three years in the summer and they gave him the contract and it was like, well, we... It was gonna, dead before Watford, though. We're going to ride or die with this guy and and it's, it's on them and it's like ooh we have to hold a mirror up to ourselves and uh, people aren't good at holding mirrors up to themselves particularly people who've made decisions like that Daniel some other names right just indulge us here right uh, yes. let's let's say Pochettino sticks with Paris Saint-Germain till the summer and everybody understands that he's the number one guy and he's going to be with them till the summer and, and he continues in the tournament and something happens because Mbappe is in, in reasonable form at the moment so it's it's possible 
Could Alex Ferguson take over? We <laughs> now in the end. No, of absolutely not. <laughs> really? There is not a chance. Daniel yeah. Harris is a better chance, surely. I mean, <laughs> why? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, Ferg's, Ferg's he's going to be 80 um, New Year's Eve. Um, so, and he knew, I'm absolutely sure he knew what he was doing getting out when he got out. Why is he going to go and piss on his legacy? It's, there's not a chance. Um, no. Wenger. That would be funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> not ruling it out. <laughs> um, as, an, as an interim manager till the end of the season, uh yeah, that that I hadn't I hadn't thought of it. I hadn't heard it, but it probably sounds like a better idea than most of the others that I've heard. Would he take it? Ah, yeah, of course he would. I think that his sense of mischief, and not just that, his sense of personal pride. Arsenal fired him. That hurt. He got fired by Arsenal. Look what's happened to Arsenal subsequently. Does his missus want to live in Manchester? I, um, I don't know. I don't know what his <laughs> personal situation. I don't know, but I mean, I mean. I don't. I don't see. Don't see why not. Um, I mean. I mean. Yeah. I. 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 I think if they if they offered Arsene Wenger, the problem for Wenger is that he probably wouldn't want the job till the end of the season if he was going to take it. If he'd probably want the job, um, he, and that'd be that would be. It, that's not going to happen. He's got that professor of world football thing going on where you, you know that that's a lot to give up. And it would be perfect. Kind of, I hand this over to somebody. Uh, it's, it's a. It, it would. Yeah, it's yeah. Free. To hand, to hand, I mean, the other side, it might get him out of this biannual World Cup mess he's creating. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like taking over the grandchild because there's a mess in the relationship. Yeah, like, I'll be the grandfatherly figure and I'll look after the child for, you know, bring him to my little cottage in France for three months. The glue, the glue baby. Yes. I'm giving him back. I'm absolutely yeah. giving him back to you. Uh, okay, so, like, are we looking then. Are we looking at a Mark Hughes figure or something like that till the end of the season where somebody who we all know has no chance of getting this job and they're not going to give it to him? Even if you win the Champions League, you're not getting this job. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that they'd probably wait and see, like, they'd probably wait and see what happened because it is only this interim situation. If there's no one obvious who presents themselves, who they think we should definitely get this person, then... They, uh, they might see what happens with Carrick. I mean, I I felt. I mean, I I would be amazed if Carrick was particularly good at this. Um, it doesn't. I mean, it, it was. It, what is, will be interesting with Carrick is it will be interesting to see who he who he picks mm. because did, was he totally on the same page as Ole? I mean, it is a bit weird that everyone else is staying. Usually, when a manager leaves, they take everyone with them. Um, but it would be it's kind of strange that because it feels like they're all kind of tarred with that brush when the manager gets fired that it wasn't just him it was him and his staff and it feels like oh they maybe I mean I'm, I'm guessing again here might have negotiated for the club to keep his staff because he does speak about them a lot and we all saw in the interview he got quite emotional speaking about Carrick It'd be interesting to see who Carrick picks on Tuesday if it if he picks an Ole team or if he does something a little bit different because for example Van der Beek came on on at half time and played really well against Watford. Well enough to earn his spot given how badly everyone else is playing. So I guess they might see what happens with Carrick over the next couple of games. And given that it is only going to be an interim, if it is going to only be an interim, let's say they can't get Pochettino or Pochettino doesn't want to come or whatever, then maybe they let Carrick see how it goes with Carrick because who knows whether Mark Hughes is going to come in and make it any better. But I mean, I... I, I just like no one really knows the answer to this. I mean, something Mark Hughes is one of those polarizing figures. Also, when I say he's polarizing, I mean he's polarizing within the same people because he's a United hero who then went and managed City and seemed to want to antagonize United at the same time. Uh, I personally have forgiven him as a supporter for that because he gave me some of the greatest moments of my life. Was one of my first heroes. I had a hamster called Sparky in sometime in the oh, late eighties. Nice. <laughs> I know. I had Robbo the hamster. Who, who didn't last very long. And then I had Sparky, who was much more robust and then went and died at our neighbours. So, uh, didn't you call any pet kind of, after Ollie, some, did you? Some kind of congruence there. No, by the time Ollie was there, I was kind of beyond, beyond the age of hamsters. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, I mean, Mark Hughes, there's, I mean, people mentioned Laurent Blanc, but I mean, he just, I saw me probably turn my nose up there. I saw myself in my own screen turning my nose up because I've seen Laurent Blanc complaining about like too many strong fast athletic black players and yeah i, mm. I, I and that it may be that he has apologized for that and i haven't seen it um and done like some kind of repentance but in the meantime 
just an adult saying that yeah. kind of stuff. No and, thanks. Yeah, no. Uh, um, after that, who else is on the list? Um, uh, we mentioned we mentioned Rangnick. Rangnick obviously makes a lot of sense. Um, he, I mean, he's never had as big a job as United, but he seems to know quite a lot about building football clubs. So, are there but, any are there any left field selections to be made where? You know, so if Eddie Howe was still uh, on the available list, people in his his supporters in the English media would have made the case for a young, progressive English manager. Look what he could do with the talent. I don't think Eddie Howe would have been good enough for this job. He certainly hasn't yet got the track record. Needs to manage in the Champions League. It'd be good to see that. What about somebody like Bielsa? Um, to get, but I, I mean, Bielsa. I don't know. Bielsa seems to be really happy in Leeds. I mean, he. He's 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 a strange one, Bielsa, because he he's not he's done some he's, he's delivered some amazing football, but not that much in the way of amazing results. But I don't think United are going to go and get Bielsa from Leeds in the summer, and he's going to take the job. I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I think that if Bielsa was available, he'd be someone you might go and get as an interim. But I don't think that they're going to go and give Bielsa the job full time. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be Ten Hag or Pochettino probably are the first choices, and then after that. Brendan Rogers probably next. Um, the board might fancy Zidane. Zidane doesn't seem to fancy the job. And as we say, like there's that there's that Pochettino Zidane job affair where Pochettino comes to United and Zidane goes to Paris. Um, I don't think that there that Joel Glazer and the rest of the board, who ultimately have to carry the can for everything that happens at United, know enough or care enough about football to go and get someone out of their field, as you say. I don't think that they're busy looking around thinking who is the next. So we know that the best coaches in the world right now are probably Tuchel, um, Klopp and Guardiola. I don't think they're sitting there watching other football in other countries, never, young English coaches thinking who is the next one of these. Why would you they're run just, a football club and care about football? Well, that's exactly it, isn't it? I mean, United aren't there for, their, for the football. United are there as a, they're, they're an ATM. A cash machine for, for the Glazer family. That's why they bought them. It, like, it doesn't matter that they happen to be a football team. If they were making the same money and they were something else and the Glazers saw that they were undervalued, if they're making, I don't know, if they're making arse paper and the Glazers saw that they were undervalued, then the Glazers might fancy buying them. And it's not to do with the actual football. It's just to do with the investment. And they saw that English football clubs were undervalued, that the biggest name was undervalued. They saw the avenues for sponsorship that hadn't been explored. Yeah. They saw they saw the um their way in TV rights. Their the way Super League wasn't there, and then they bought that's that's why they did it. Their way in of, of course was in the row between um JP McManus, John Magner right. and Alex Ferguson. That was the it was their shares they bought at the mm. start to get them to get this train rolling. So it all comes back to the Rocket Gibraltar and that horse. <laughs> Um, uh, as, as Roy Keane said, I mean, the Roy, uh, we say we say it often. Roy, Roy Keane was right. And that, <laughs> yeah. that is absolutely that is absolutely true. And I mean, it, it almost began before that because Fergie had no leverage against the Glazers because they knew where the bodies were buried. Um, they had uh, there was they had the, the questions to which they wanted answers about where particular money was disappearing to, and about and there was the the documentary that Michael Crick made called Fergie and Son that asked some difficult questions to which we still haven't got answered. we still haven't got all the answers to those and and um, obviously well we've uh, got, Ferg we've got Ferguson, Ferguson has answers. refuted many of the just for for clarity's sake here this morning <laughs> before yeah, we yeah no we've yeah. got we've got what we've got what the suggested answers are and the uh, no one's given us any other any different answers right like there was definitely have been some answers that have been hypothesised by the BBC. Yeah, and and uh, we need to go back and, and revisit those. <laughs> um, but but we haven't we haven't had we haven't had other answers yet. Maybe, yeah. maybe there are other well, answers, but I, if there are, we haven't. It's not right to say that there haven't been answers. There haven't been answers that that refute the, so the, the answers. The, the, the Ferguson side of things has to um, has to come out properly. I suppose it would be. Uh, but the point the point persists, right? Like um, I know the Glazers get a lot of. Uh, and rightly so, opprobrium from Manchester United fans who question their motives and their involvement in the club. But at the same time, it is also true to say that there has been enough money invested in the team for the team to be better than it is at the moment. So, mm. you know... Oh, 100%. This mm. team, yeah, this, this, there's a good team here. And that's why this sacking, 
and this period of appalling football is feels different to the appalling football that we've seen previously under Moyes, Van Gaal and Mourinho. And it's not just that Ole is a club legend, it's actually that he's he's got a good team. Like we've seen this team play well, we've seen this team beat good teams, we've seen this team I mean I I know that there were no supporters in go unbeaten away from home for a year. I mean I know that there are no supporters in, which does make it different. It's not yeah. the same as when Arsenal did it, but no one else did it. If it was so easy, why did no one else do it? Yeah. Um, no one else did it. And but and it's the fact that when 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 Moyes left, you kind of thought, oh, it was Fergie's team is finished, it's old and it's slow. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here. Van Gaal turned up, and when he left, and they were dreadful, and you thought, again, there's some, there's some good players, but there's a lot of work to be done. And similarly with Mourinho, the team was crap. Like there wasn't as crap as it needed as Mourinho as it was under Mourinho, and there were still again some good players. But you thought, well, how many of these players would I want to keep? How many of these players would get anywhere near a decent United team? Now that's no longer the case. United have got some some brilliant players. I mean, it's top heavy. There's some brilliant attackers. There's some brilliant young attackers. But there's a good enough team there to absolutely to, to, to be. I mean, they finished second last season. Yeah, exactly. Season. You had a, you had some central midfielders to this team, and let's go and and have a tactical identity. And, and all of a sudden, so it is. It should still be a fairly exciting job. Daniel, we're out of time. Good stuff. Thanks, Daniel, for joining us. See you guys, bro. Have a good day. It's um, Daniel Harris there giving his thoughts and we've only got to wait another 36 hours until the team are back out. <laughs> Never a Captain by that, Donny van de Beek. The hamster is a good analogy. It's just like, just keeps turning.